Great. If I could have everyone's attention, uh, both here in the room and online, I want to welcome you all for joining us uh, to another installment of our Forward and Energy Forum. I'm glad to see folks in the room here and uh, those of you joining online. Um, my name is Scott Williams. I'm a research and education coordinator at the Wisconsin Energy Institute. Um, and I'm one of the co-organizers of this monthly Forward and Energy Forum. Um, no matter where you're joining uh, from today, just want to make sure that you make yourself comfortable. Uh, if you're joining online, if you have any questions or concerns, um, if you need something repeated, feel free to put that in the chat. Uh, we want to be as accommodating as possible. Uh, if this is your first time uh, joining us for one of our events, uh, the Wisconsin Energy Institute, which is based at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, it's our mission to provide leadership uh, on campus uh, for multidisciplinary research, education, and outreach efforts uh, with the goal of accelerating the world's transition to clean energy systems and solutions. The Forward and Energy Forum is part of our efforts at the Wisconsin Energy Institute to cultivate public understanding of energy issues. And this is a monthly series that brings together experts both on and off campus with the goal of encouraging cross-disciplinary dialogue to explore the important technical, social, political, and economic dimensions of a wide variety of clean energy innovations and topics. Our panel today uh, will be discussing the many ways that energy and climate issues intersect with disability the overlapping structural inequities that people with disabilities often face, as well as solutions to address those inequities. Before we launch into today's session, I want to first acknowledge that the land that the Wisconsin Energy Institute occupies, as well as all of UW-Madison, is the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk people, uh, who have called this land De Jope since time immemorial. We recognize and respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation and the 11 other First Nations that reside in the boundaries of the state of Wisconsin. And we also want to acknowledge that tribal nations are often uh, doing some of the most important and leading work in transitioning toward clean and just energy systems. Uh, a few other announcements as well. Uh, first, I wanna give another plug for our podcast series, Propelling Women in Power, which highlights the stories of women energy researchers here at the Wisconsin Energy Institute and the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. Uh, it's a really great series uh, to hear about the successes and challenges and advice uh, of women energy researchers uh, here on campus um, and with our uh, partner research institutions. Uh, season two is currently in the works. And so in the meantime, you can subscribe uh, to our uh, uh, podcast with future episodes. There's a QR code or the link uh, go.wis.edu slash pod. Uh, to get uh, subscribed to that. And you can check out the season one episodes as well. Next, our, uh, our next forum in February will be held on uh, Tuesday, February 28th at 4.30 p.m. Central Time. And in honor of Black History Month, uh, we've got an exciting panel of, of Black leaders in clean energy um, that we're, we're really pleased and excited about. And uh, they'll be sharing their experiences and advice as we uh, transition to a cleaner and more just energy future. Uh, and you can, I know uh, some of the links are, are being posted in the chat. If you're joining us online, uh, you can go to energy.wis.edu slash events to see all of our upcoming events. And then finally, some logistic, logistical notes. Uh, we'll have some opening remarks from our panelists and Q&A uh, with our moderator before taking some audience questions. Uh, if you're in the room, just raise your hand, um, ask your question. Our moderator will repeat it for the online audience. Uh, for those online, you can submit your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll uh, alternate between in-person and online questions as they come in. Um, finally, for those joining via Zoom, you may see that uh, we have live captioning turned on, so uh, please utilize that resource if you would like. Um, if you have any other technical concerns, um, please use the chat to let us know that. All right, and with that, I will uh, introduce today's moderator, uh, Mari Magler, who is the director of the McBurney Disability Resource Center here at UW-Madison. Mari has worked in the field of disability and disability, disability advocacy since 1994 and in higher education since 2005. Mari is passionate about disability justice, access and inclusion, and we are pleased to have her uh, kick things off with some focusing remarks and introductions of our panelists. Thank you, Mari. Thank you, Scott, and hello, everybody, and welcome to the forum. I'm really excited to be joining this conversation today. Um, as Scott mentioned, I'm Mari Magler. I use she, her pronouns. 
Um, in addition to the work that I do, I also identify as disabled myself. So I kind of bring that into the space with me. I also want to just echo and, re and sort of lift up what Scott said about making yourselves comfortable. So please take this as an invitation to really do that. Be present in the space, however, whatever works best for you. So if you're in the physical room with us today and you need to get up and pace or you want to stand in the back or sit on the floor, please do that. If you need to come and go, that's all right as well. Um, if you're joining us virtually, we welcome you as well. We're excited to have you and, and same goes. Please take care of yourselves and be present in whatever way works best for you. So I'm really excited to be joining the panel. Um, this is a topic as, as Scott maybe shared or is part of my bio online. I've been in the field for a long time, been doing work for a long time and living with myself an even longer time, <laughs> right? So I feel like lots of years of experience and when the topic of energy, climate justice, intersecting with disability justice, I had to stop and think about the fact that I haven't thought intentionally about those intersections. And that has a huge impact. If I think about justice and hoping to work toward justice, I need to be right committing to that cross movement, cross disability, kind of cross everything solidarity. So I'm really excited to be just to be part of tonight's um, events. I also wanted to do just a really quick visual description of myself, um, if that's helpful for anybody. I am a white woman. I'm a, in my early 50s with silvery chin length hair. And I'm in the space today wearing a gray cardigan sweater with a red um, shirt underneath it. So I'm going to first read just a little bit about the panelists that we have. And then I will be asking each of them to talk more. Please add anything to your introductions that I might not cover today. I'm just going to do a little bit of highlighting today. So one of our uh, virtual part panelists today is Dr. Diana Hernandez, who is a tenured professor, associate professor of sociomedical sciences at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. Hernandez conducts research at the intersection of energy, equity, housing, and health. A sociologist by training, her work focuses on the social and environmental determinants of health and examines the impacts of policy and place based interventions on the health and well being of socioeconomically disadvantaged populations. Welcome, Diana. Next with us also um, in the room here, we have Katie Collins. Katie is a clinical assistant professor and global health coordinator in the School of Nursing here at UW-Madison. She is a nurse practitioner with certifications in both the adult gerontology, primary care, and family nurse practitioner specialty. <laughs> Dr. Collins uh, currently also currently practices in the internal medicine department at SSM Health. And her prior experience includes medical mission work in Gramoth, Haiti, as well as disaster preparedness research on the islands of St. Kitts and Nevis. Shifting back to our online panelists, we have Dr. Angela Frederick. She is an associate professor of sociology in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Texas, El Paso, or UTEP. Dr. Frederick is a qualitative researcher with expertise in the area of gender, disability, race, ethnicity, and social class. In her newest project, Dr. Frederick is examining the impact of climate-related disasters on people with disabilities and chronic health conditions. And finally, back in the room here, we have Amal Khan. Amal is a fourth year undergraduate student here at UW-Madison studying philosophy and data science. She is also an intern at the newly forming Disability Cultural Center here on campus, where she helps promote and bring awareness to disability justice on campus. Additionally, Amal is a student researcher at the Davis Lab at the UW School of Medicine and Public Health, which specializes in diabetes and meta metabolism treatment. I knew I was going to stumble over that word. <laughs> metabolism. Okay, so that's a, just a little bit about our panelists, but to get things started, um, I'm hoping that each of you panelists can help us kind of get up to speed as an audience. There are so many threads that are woven into the topic of discussion, right? 
So for someone who may not be thinking about energy and disability day to day, as I might have outed myself a few minutes ago, what are some of the ways that you see disability and energy intersecting? And we'll start with Diana, please. Uh, so good evening. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, I appreciate the invitation and would have loved to be there in person, but uh, myself felt ill last week and um, needed to accommodate um, and, and uh, do the panel online. Um, and so I'm really grateful for the virtual option. I just want to start by saying that um, I'm in the midst of completing um, my book manuscript. Um, it's going out for review uh, this week. So I've been thinking a lot about the kind of intersections between energy and health. Um, I'm an expert um, in the area of energy insecurity, which uh, my work kind of defines as the inability to adequately meet household energy needs. And there are two really critical crisis points of energy insecurity. The first one is um, really a manifestation of a chronic, um, the, the chronic ways in which energy insecurity might be experienced at the population level, and that's around disconnections. And disconnections really come forward uh, primarily when people are unable to pay their utilities um, on a regular basis. So for some of us, paying utilities is kind of even absent-minded, right? Um, it kind of is debited from our accounts. We don't really think about the actual number, may or may not even interact with a bill. But there are some people for whom uh, the bill is a major source of stress um, and it's something that is really unachievable and there are many kind of coping strategies that come along with that um, and, and people kind of have to interact with um, with this challenge um, and ultimately can lead to disconnections um, because people are unable to keep up. But the other piece of this kind of chronic um, or crisis point of energy insecurity has to do with power outages and as we think about climate change um, and climate justice, uh, we're also kind of, I'm also kind of thinking a lot about people who don't have access to uh, solar and storage, um, also known as resilient power. And if they are living with uh, durable medical equipment um, or need uh, air conditioning, for instance, to stay alive um, or access to electricity to run their oxygen concentrator, et cetera, you know, you really do risk fatality uh, when it comes to these crisis points of energy, um, be it because of affordability challenges or because of access issues having to do with climate change. So I wanted to um, share some brief um, excerpts from uh, my upcoming book. It's called Powerless, The People Struggle with Energy Insecurity uh, in America. Hopefully we'll be out uh, with Russell Sage Foundation this year. Um, and I just want to kind of um, just point out two stories um, and a broader vision uh, for how to think about these issues, along with two takeaways. So um, pardon me for reading, but I'm going to read directly, and I, I promise to be done um, in a few minutes. So any household with medical vulnerabilities, such as chronic illness, disability, or mobility issues, may, um, may well be likely uh, to experience limitations in income production. Um, and the medical conditions themselves also may require higher energy demands that drive up costs. For instance, someone that relies on electronic, electronically powered medical devices such as a sleep apnea machine, an oxygen concentrator, concentrator, or is receiving intense therapies at home, such as dialysis, may have a higher electricity bill. Medical vulnerable uh, individuals may also be less able to practice energy reduction strategies, see, such as keeping a home at an unhealthy temperature or leaving the premises to seek comfort elsewhere due to mobility challenges. The homebound are more susceptible to adverse outcomes stemming from disconnections or service disruptions. So that's kind of a way to kind of think about these links. I just also wanted to very briefly share the story of Shamika who I met um, in Philadelphia. Um, and basically um, she was part, is part of the deaf and mute um, community in Philadelphia. Um, and she was able to essentially um, kind of give me a vantage point uh, into the circumstances of living without natural gas and the kind of um, 
circumstances of having to manage being a parent and also um, kind of living with some of the uh, limitations um, of, uh, of, of income as a result of um, her and her husband's um, status um, as disabled people. Um, so I'm going to just kind of put this in, in the context of uh, disconnection. So depending on the year, roughly two to three million U.S. households experience a shutoff like the one experienced by Shamika. According to uh, the Residential Energy Consumption um, Survey data, 2.3 million households were shut off in 2020, a year when most of the U.S. population was covered by a shutoff moratorium. When we look at the 2015 data, there are more than 3.3 million, and that's actually consistent with the current day um, figures. So that 3% of all, all uh, U.S. households have experienced a disconnection in any given year. These figures likely underestimate the true prevalence of disconnections because a disconnected household is far less likely than a connected household to have been able to complete the survey to begin with. Um, so, um, Many don't even think about a uh, disconnection coming as Shamika, who'd lived in the Lawndale section of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, didn't. It was only after she couldn't turn on the stove and the water ran cold at the faucet that she realized that something was wrong. When she confronted her, her partner, Kenny, uh, the father of their two children, um, he, had, he said he had forgotten to pay the bill. He said, I focus on electric. She said, I focus on electric. He focuses on the gas, but he's also busy worried about paying for the car and the insurance. And he drops our daughter off to school with the car. It's like, he's not really thinking about the gas bill and boom, it got cut off. Um, and so one of the challenges for them in managing this circumstance had a lot to do with how to make do without um, gas. So she's so uh, the story kind of continues. Without gas for their stove, Shamika and her family ate tuna fish sandwiches for dinner. Thankfully, the electricity was still on um, to heat the water in the microwave in preparation for their evening bath time. Shamika would walk up flights of stairs uh, between the lower level of the house and the living room and the kitchen uh, to the bathroom on the second on the second floor with a bucket of hot water for the girls' bath. I put a, a plastic container in the microwave and I poured the hot water into a larger pot and I let the uh, water warm up for about three minutes. Um, and it takes about three containers to fill the pot. And when it's ready, I go up five or six or seven times and then I put a little cold water in the tub so that the water is just right. Really kind of just demonstrating how taxing um, all of this work is. I'm not going to continue. I wanted to kind of share more stories, but I, I will say that uh, the two takeaways um, that I'd like to kind of put forward as policy prescriptions are first really greater um, greater protections around um, specifically for um, people living with medical vulnerabilities and disabilities when it comes to disconnections. There are very, first of all, it's really onerous to get these kinds of protections. And also, um, it's a real big challenge when it comes to kind of qualifying um, based on certain medical conditions. So for instance, um, pregnancy, infancy, these are not um, kind of protected windows and many disabilities kind of go unrecognized, even though people are really susceptible to the challenges of living without power um, as they live with uh, disabilities. And the other piece is really about equipping homes um, with the necessary equipment so that they do have kind of uninterrupted access to power. Those are really kind of critical takeaways from the work that I've been doing to establish first that there is this kind of link between energy and health, but also to be thinking about what are the extensions of protections that are necessary, both from a policy perspective, but also from a technical perspective, um, which we now have. So I'm gonna stop there. Sorry that I took a, a lot of time in reading excerpts of the book. That was great, Diana. Thank you so much. Really, really great information to be shared. And we'll definitely have time to come back to some of those to expand on. Um, by way of introductions, next, let's go to Angela, please. Hi, thank you all so much for having me. I'm so excited to be part of this panel. And this will be the first time that I'm presenting 
findings from a study that I've been working on examining the impact of winter storm URI on Texans with disabilities. So I have so much to say. Um, and so I think I might, uh, I decided to divide my time. So I'll um, talk about the disaster. Um, and then I want to really devote my uh, introduction to the stories of people who did not make it um, in Texas and dis in the disability community. And um, I will then, during the q and I'll share stories of the people, 58 people that I've interviewed for this project. Um, but I did want to, um, you know, uh, save time to honor the people who I did not get to interview because they um, perished in this disaster. So winter, what we now call winter storm URI was actually the convergence of three Arctic fronts that pummeled 25 states in the U.S. in February of 2021. Um, this uh, extreme weather event was particularly disastrous for Texas and sociologists um, argue that you know, disasters aren't defined by the weather event itself. It's defined disaster. We define disasters by the collapse of social infrastructure and the loss of life and, and uh, property. And so in Texas, the, these extreme weather events um, uh, led to the collapse of infrastructure. And so um, for those of you who don't know much about Texas, um, we are the only state that 90% uh, of our state is on an independent power grid. Um, and therefore, we cannot borrow power from neighboring states in disasters like Winter Storm Uri. Um, perhaps even more significant for this disaster um, that because we're an independent power grid, we avoid uh, federal regulations. And so um, particularly the gas industry was not required to weatherize for extreme cold. I um, mean, we had a, a, a warning event 10 years prior to winter storm URI, um, where we had major long, disaster, long duration power outages in a winter storm. Um, and uh, ERCOT, uh, the Texas independent power grid, um, decided not to heed uh, uh, recommendations from the federal government nor to weatherize and nor were they required to do so as an independent grid. So fast forward to February 14th, 2021, due to cascading issues, uh, failures with multiple uh, energy sectors, um, the uh, power grid, uh, uh, the demand on the power grid far ex exceeded the supply and supply was also severely diminished during this time due to infrastructure failures. Um, and Texas was four minutes and 30 seconds away from a statewide blackout, which would have required a black start, which would, would have left basically left the state in the dark for months. So to avoid this uh, catastrophe, ERCOT um, uh, implemented what were supposed to be rolling power outages. Um, so um, the, the burden of energy loss during these um, Arctic temperatures, it was actually colder in many parts of Texas than it was in Alaska during this time to kind of give you some perspective. Um, what were supposed to be rolling power outages that would, you know, where people would share the burden of power loss um, ended up resulting in actuality in millions of Texas lose, Texans losing power for days as their local utility companies could not reestablish service um, once they were disconnected. Um, these, this Power outage also caused cascading infrastructure failures and rapidly became a water disaster as well. So half of Texans lost potable water uh, during this time, many for days as entire um, local water systems failed and also temperatures became so cold in people's homes that individual pipes burst and, and flooded. Um, so the consequences of winter storm URI um, were pretty tremendous, both in terms of financial costs and in terms of mortality. So the official death toll from winter storm URI is uh, 246. This makes it one of the deadliest da disasters in recent US history. Um, just to give you some perspective, this death toll far exceeds that of Hurricane Harvey, which is um, the largest rainfall event in US history just a few years prior. Um, but 
analyses of excess mortality, which is the preferred, experts really prefer this as a, they believe is a more accurate measure of deaths. And where you look at the, okay, what's the death, the, the mortality rate in a quote unquote normal week compared to the weeks around winter storm Uri. And um, these analyses place the death toll between 750 and 814. Um, each of these numbers was a uh, gut-wrenching story, and many of them involved um, people with disabilities. So I want to share some of the stories and um, uh, underscoring what Dr. Hernandez, um, part of her talk is um, how power vulnerability and power dependence um, um, really increases the risk of morbidity, uh, morbidity and mortality for people in various disability communities. So among uh, these numbers was Carol Anderson, who died um, in his truck uh, in a town outside of Houston. He had gone out to his truck to try to get um, oxygen from a portable tank he had in the truck when his oxy machine, oxygen machine in his home um, failed due to power. And he died of hyperth hypothermia um, in his truck outside of his home. Cynthia Pierce died in an Austin uh, assisted living home. Um, the residential home, uh, uh, you know, because of laws, uh, Texas laws do not require that these facilities have uh, generators to uh, regulate temperature in these kinds of disasters. And so there was no heat source in this facility. And on top of it, in the middle of the chaos, a staff member left her window open in her room and she died of hypothermia. There was also Austin resident Connie Ritchie who died in her own home in agonizing pain when the urine in her catheter froze. The temperature was so cold in her home that the urine in her catheter froze. And finally, there was uh, Zeke Mendoza of San Antonio who died um, days after the storm, but it was the result of the, uh, the fact that his kidney dialysis clinic um, limited his uh, time for dialysis, uh, cut his normal time by half, which uh, many uh, uh, people who are on dialysis around the state experienced this or weren't able to get dialysis at all. So I will stop here. Um, I do, you know, so the things that I want to highlight in my research, I'm currently working on a book called Disabled Power, Winter, People with Disabilities, Winter Storm Uri and the 2021 uh, Texas Power Crisis. And um, some of the things that I want to emphasize is um, the embodied burdens that people with a variety of disabilities experience during this disaster and the um, with the long duration power outage in the midst of freezing temperatures and uh, and freezing uh, precipitation that we Texans are not used to, um, and, but also the resilience um, that people exercise to endure and survive this disaster and the care they shared with others. Great. Thank you so much, Angela. Really um, traumatic and impactful stories to be shared, but thank you so much for starting that. Um, I'll kick it off next in the room here to Katie. All right, thank you all for being here today. I'll try and speak up. Um, so again, I'm Katie Collins. I am a nurse practitioner um, working over in the School of Nursing and also clinically at SSM. Um, so I've been a nurse for about a decade um, in a variety of different settings. I've been ICU, med surge tele, um, outpatient. Um, before I came here to Madison, I worked in a FQHC, federally qualified health center in the Chicago suburbs. Um, and so there I saw a lot of patients without insurance, um, mostly patients without insurance, um, a lot of Medicaid, a lot of Medicare, um, and, you know, uh, a variety of different patient populations, and then, you know, came here and, and work now in Dane County. Um, and what I'll say in terms of, I, I have the perspective of, you know, a, a healthcare provider, a primary care provider, um, working with patients with disabilities pretty regularly. And what I'll say is there's a couple considerations that have come up over and over again or issues that have come up over and over again with, with our patients with disabilities. And we've kind of touched on this already, thankfully to um, Diana and Angela so far. Um, but before I go into like specifics, I just want to kind of define what I'm talking about in terms of disability. So 
talking about you know vision mobility impairments hearing impairments um, speech impairments um, as well as chronic diseases as we talked about chronic kidney disease heart failure or you know end stage renal disease uh, COPD that's severe you know folks on oxygen um, as well as mental health uh, disabilities related disabilities so um, there's a lot of considerations for for folks in, in these different um, aspects of, of disability. And so we talked a little bit about um, the importance of, of heating and cooling in homes, right? And so, um, you know, there's certain chronic illnesses that certainly get worse, heart disease, kidney disease, if there's hyperthermia that occurs, um, as well as, you know, the, um, the need for energy is incredibly high in the uh, disability population, right? So um, there's a lot of machinery, there's a lot, you know, um, electric wheelchairs, um, oxygen concentrators, there's an incredible amount of energy need, right? And with energy need comes cost, right? So I, as a provider may say, you need to do this, you may need to do that, you have a machine, you know, what is the cost associated with that? And we know that there is um, economic and financial considerations in the disability community, right? So um, I just wanna talk a little bit about that. So typically I was looking at, at the latest research and you know, um, folks with disabilities are actually making about 74 to 75 cents on the dollar of, of their non-disabled counterparts, right? And, and companies are still getting away, and we'll talk about policies, so don't let me get a, you know too much into it, but um, companies are still getting away with paying folks with disabilities less than minimum wage, and that's not acceptable. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the policy questions. Um, but some other considerations. So I have to take that into consideration. What are the energy needs of the, the prescriptions or the treatments that I'm recommending for my patients? Um, and what are the financial considerations of that as well, right? And we know there are some government policies and things that help. We know SSDI can be helpful, but SSDI can certainly limit the amount that you can work and make on your own monthly. So um, in general, in order to qualify for SSDI, you can only make somewhere between $1,470, so $1,470 to $2,460 per month. And then the maximum, and we know most people are not getting the maximum amount of SSDI, is actually $3,627 as of 2023. So again, this really goes into the financial considerations that we have for our patients. Um, and then just going back to kind of considerations, um, with the advent of telehealth, it's been fantastic. Um, for a lot of different things, it's been fantastic, especially for mental health, right? So, and, you know, as we're talking about mental health in, in relation to disability, I'm grateful that we have these telehealth resources, but the other consideration, again, goes to energy and goes to cost. So if a patient does not have transportation, but can use telehealth, that's well and good, but how are they charging their phones? How are they receiving smartphones? And we know there are some programs and things to help with cost of that, but again, it's just another consideration of cost. Um, so that's really kind of what I wanted to say in terms of, um, of the healthcare component of things. Um, lastly, another little fun statistic, not so fun. Um, persons with disabilities are twice as likely to receive inadequate healthcare. And so we know there's a lot of systemic issues and policy issues that need to be improved for that to work better. And so, um, and then um, additionally, I will say from, from a personal standpoint, um, as a provider, you know, we, we know that patients with Medicaid sometimes have difficulty finding uh, finding companies and providers that, that will take that insurance. And we know that's especially hard with mental health, right? Um, and it can take months, many months actually to, to receive the services that are needed from specialty, from mental health. Um, and uh, in relation to that, um, essentially it's, it's, our, it's, it's frustrating from a, from a provider standpoint to you know, have our patients to, as a primary care provider, say, this is the treatments that I'm recommending for you, and then it takes three to six months to get in, and meanwhile, our patients are, are suffering, right? Um, you know, additionally, I will say there's a lot of paperwork and there's a lot of specific wording that goes into actually getting certain things approved, and I will say from a very personal standpoint, um, ordering oxygen for our patients, you would think that this was a very straightforward thing to do, and it's not. So there, it can take, you know, you would think, okay, someone with COPD, they're, ox you know, they're, they, it's, you know, severe, they need oxygen, should be pretty quick to get oxygen. It's not always easy to do that. It's not easy to get mobility aids, hearing aids. We know it definitely in Medicare, in, in a population that should be very well covered are not, and patients are shelling out $2,000. Right, so I don't want to get too far in my soapbox about that, but um, you know, feel free to to ask questions more about that. Um, my, my little sheet here. So, um, because I'm the global health coordinator, I would be remiss not to mention some global considerations. 
Um, as we know, there have been some skyrocketing energy prices. We know there have been crises in relation to food prices, in relation to gas prices, both here, both in, in Europe as well. Um, we know that this has been exacerbated by the Russian, Ukraine, uh, Russian invasion of the Ukraine, right? So we know that a lot of energy was coming from Russia. And so now we are needing to find different sources of energy, um, especially in Europe. Um, and we know that this is, you know, this is playing a role in terms of, are we going to continue using non-renewable sources of energy? Are we actually going to go backwards in that? So are we actually, our countries, and, and, and we're worried about that, our country is actually going to say, let's put a hold on renewable, sustainable sources of energy and actually go backwards because of these crises, these costs, right? And so that's been an issue. Um, so consideration as well. And then I'll just briefly talk about um, Pakistan. So you may have seen in the news last week, Pakistan had an energy crisis where essentially they were working to conserve energy because we have these energy crises occurring, right? They were working to conserve energy. And so they had kind of, as far as I understand it, um, had wanted to conserve energy during night when, when most folks aren't using it as much. Unfortunately, when they tried to turn that energy back up during the day, it didn't, it didn't turn on like it was supposed to. And so pretty much the entire country was, was cut off from energy at that point. And we know if you, you can just imagine, we've kind of talked about what happens when when patients and persons with disability do not have um, appropriate energy, right? So um, 24 hours, even a couple hours, as we know, I mean, if it's hot, if it's cold, you know, we're negative how many degrees here in Wisconsin? So if our, our heat turns off, you know, we risk of hypothermia and we're hearing these, you know, sad, sad stories that could be avoided. Um, so I think that was is all I will say about that for now until we get to the questions and I'm all, I'll uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Amal Khan, and I'm a senior studying philosophy and data science. Um, I'm here to share my student perspective as a student with a disability. So I was diagnosed with a chronic illness at the start of high school, and consequently, uh, a, ma a majority of my higher education experience has been guided by my illness, whether that meant adjusting classes or taking time off school or influ influencing what I chose to study. As a college student, I've had a lot of opportunities to explore my identities, such as being Pakistani American and Muslim. But recently I've started to engage with my identity as a person with a disability. There are many experiences that can make a student with a disability feel isolated from their peers. We have to consider alternative routes to classes, get accommodations approved by professors, and test in separate spaces, spaces than our peers. We also need to put a stronger emphasis on balancing health with academics. This can be a very difficult feat and often is hard to accomplish. But beyond the college campus, there were certain changes I needed to consider depending on my environment. For example, travel is often more difficult for disabled people. One part of the struggle is the logistics of getting to your destination and another is the climate of the destination. As a child of immigrants, my family and I often travel back to Pakistan to f visit family and friends. Certain adjustments I could anticipate, like dietary restrictions, being careful to drink bottled water, or avoiding fresh fruits and dairy. But something I didn't anticipate during my trip in the summer, where temperatures went above 100 degrees, was how the climate would affect my medical devices. For example, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with ostomy bags, but they require an ad adhesive to stick to a part of your skin to function properly. But due to the extreme heat and humidity, the rate as to which I had to replace this medical device was almost two times the frequency as here in Wisconsin. Whereas I was just visiting, a person requiring the same medical device as me living in Pakistan all year round would need to spend more of their income on this medical device. This is a smaller scale individual example of how extreme climate disproportionately affects disabled people. On a larger scale, um, uh, Pakistan's entire infrastructure was severely damaged by recent floods in 2022. They experienced five times more rain than usual in just July and August. This flooding destroyed schools and hospitals and displaced millions of people. Even now, the country is still about 25% underwater. And so not only has this led to an increase in waterborne diseases, but also the electric grids have been damaged. So more people are affected by the lack of electricity. I thought it would be helpful to illustrate the scale of this destruction through a story very personal to me. My family in Pakistan runs a medium-sized farm in Sindh province, about three hours from Karachi. 
They grow a variety of crops like mangoes, bananas, sugarcane, onion, and cotton. As a result of the floods, 100% of these crops were destroyed. And this was common amongst all the farms in the area. It took them about three to four months to drain all the water into a nearby canal. And this was considered a lucky situation. And after all of that work, maybe 25% of the mangoes were salvage salvageable, but everything else was gone. So as a result, these floods and the agricultural loss have lasting effects on people's health through various factors like taking away their livelihood, increasing food scarcity, poor quality of air, lack of access to school and hospital, and the list goes on. Tying this all back to the topic of disability and energy, the challenges I've discussed for an average person become exponentially more dif difficult for disabled people. I think it's important to bring attention to these large scale disasters by giving people examples of how it affects average families and their livelihood. This makes it easier for people around the world to understand the impact of climate change and the disproportionate effects on South Asia. And I understand it's easy to feel detached from these large world events. And we often feel very overwhelmed by the amount of information we receive every day. But I'd like to encourage people to use this information to feel empowered, to get involved and make a positive impact by sharing the stories of those affected or by providing support to organizations in Pakistan who are providing relief to victims of the flood. Even within our community, we can take action to feel more connected to each other, even if they're halfway across the world. And I'd be happy to share a list of reputable places to donate to after the presentation as well. So that's my experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, both Katie and Amal, for sharing those. Um, so there's so much, right? There's so much in this topic, as we identified earlier. Um, what I'd like to do next is just throw out kind of a framing question to get us going, and then we'll see if there are questions from the audience, either here or online, that we want to um, chip in. But just to kind of think about framing, um, we know that all too often stories about disability are framed either as stories of individual um, individuals overcoming these great obstacles uh, at great odds or showcasing individual um, vulnerability and kind of that tragedy theme, if you will. In an op-ed on climate crisis and the disproportionate risk faced by disabled people, scholar and activist Julia Watts Felzer writes, how we tell this story matters. If we persist in framing disability and climate change as a problem of physical vulnerability, we miss the underlying realities of structural violence, how ableism, racism, class inequity, and other forms of oppression work together to compound and intensify risks. Panelists, how and where do you see these different frames appearing? And what do you think it would take to shift the focus to systemic and structural inequities? Anyone wanna jump in on this one first? Angela, go ahead. Okay, so I will share some of the patterns that I see in scholarship on disasters. So there are, um, social vulnerability is a huge frame or a huge concept that is being used to frame uh, disaster inequities. Um, but and, and traditionally, social vulnerability has been measured by indices um, that tallies individual characteristics. Um, and I, I really have concern that the complexity of disabled people's lives gets missed um, in these sort of indices, right? And that the focus becomes on, uh, as uh, Julia's quote so eloquently states, that the focus, um, you know, we locate the vulnerability within an individual body rather than the structural processes that created these, um, a lot of these burdens or exaggerated uh, burdens related to disability. And so the sociologist Kathleen Tierney um, argues, you know, people aren't born vulnerable, they're made 
vulnerable. Um, and then uh, another piece uh, issue with framing. So social capital is also a huge concept uh, within disaster research and disability disabled people are really largely invisible in this literature. Um, and when they do appear, um, they're often portrayed as sort of objects of rescue. Like, isn't it great that uh, disabled people have these neighbors who can rescue them. And in my research, I find that people, yes, it's great to have community, but we don't want to miss the kinds of constraints, the, the difficult decisions that people had to make um, accessing social capital. Um, and also disabled communities themselves as sources of strength and resilience are missing altogether in this literature. And I just, uh, I'll close that my answer with just one story because I promised I would share, share some stories from my research. So um, I interviewed a young man um, who is diabetic and he also is blind um, due to diabetes. And he and his wife, his wife is also blind, were in their apartment for several days. They were rationing their phones because they didn't know, um, you know how long they would be stuck in their apartment. And, um, and they were getting dangerous low on cell phone power. So they said, we've got to make a decision now. They called 911. Um, they said, well, we can come get you, but the only place we can take you is a warming shelter. Well, being diabetic, um, this is right as vaccines were starting to roll out, but still we were mostly at home, right? Um, he didn't feel like that was a safe option. And a friend of his who is also legally blind, um, the three of them made a decision and uh, the friend had power in his home. So he chose to walk four miles um, to um, get his two friends and they walked together four miles in treacherous conditions. And keep in mind in Texas, we do not have snow boots. We do not have down jackets or we don't have a lot of wool items. So, you know, in Texas clothing and Texas shoes, um, they walked four miles in these, um, you know, dangerous, dangerous conditions. And I would like to see more of these stories of resilience and care and um, recognition of the strength within disability communities um, in the midst of major infrastructure failures. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Anyone else want to jump in on this thought? Diana. I, I can't agree with Angela more that kind of focusing in on narratives and really narratives that are asset based and strength based um, are so critical. We can't keep telling stories about how people are victimized and vulnerable without also acknowledging all of the ways in which they're also um, you know, managing under really difficult circumstances and, and su surviving and thriving. And that, you know, the communities that we often peg as vulnerable also have a lot to sh show us and to teach us. Um, and, and that is really kind of um, a big part of the work that, that I've been putting forward too, is just to kind of not only humanize, but also really um, uh, acknowledge just how much uh, people are doing. But I think also uh, really uh, kind of highlighting the upstream determinants um, Dr. Collins kind of talked a lot about what happens in healthcare settings, but in public health, a lot of what we focus on as well are, you know, kind of thinking about what's happening further upstream and calling out housing providers, utility service providers, uh, the kind of institutions that are setting up this structural violence and the ways in which that occurs. And that's sometimes just, you know, like a lot of the policies that exist are completely arbitrary. So calling it out, I appreciate uh, the report, uh, the Powerless in the US um, a report that was shared in, in the chat. You know, we need more of that kind of work that is situating it in evidence, but also really pointing to the actors that are allowing this kind of work to happen. And it isn't just about individual impact. If not, it's also really the story is like, how is this coming forward? How is this structure happening? Who's really uh, responsible for uh, what we're seeing um, on the kind of tail end of things? Thank you very much. Anything to add here in the room? Yeah, Katie. No, yeah. No, I can't. No, no, it's fine. 
um, just to kind of add on to, to what everybody else is kind of saying, thank you. Um, I would say in terms of, of considering, you know, systemic inequities um, from a global standpoint and, and bringing in the idea of, of climate crises that have been occurring, um, if we look at, you know, developing countries, we know that, you know, and again, in my experience, I've, I've been to uh, several Caribbean island nations and so kind of seen the impact there um, of, of disasters and climate related disasters. And so we know um, those countries such as the US and China, we, we have really the greatest impact in terms of climate and the negative impacts that we're seeing that are affecting climate. And yet we're the ones, you know, really feeling it the least, ironically. So, um, you know, the systemic issues, I mean, there really needs to be global change. You know, we really need to invest in considering these other countries that are feeling, you know, the, the decisions that we're making here. Um, and in relation to disability, so 80% of persons with disabilities are actually in these developing countries. So there's this compounding, you know, we have climate crises that are occurring and we have a, a very large proportion of, of persons with disabilities in these developing countries who are, are being hard hit by climate crises. Um, and I, you know, I would really like to see absolutely here in the US, I would like to see change and I'll talk about that, but you know, globally as well, um, you know, what is the buy-in for considering these other nations and considering us as a global community? Um, you know, and then of course there, you know, is the considerations for intersectionality and, you know, not just looking at someone with a disability based on the disability, but also what are other vulnerability factors for that person, gender, sexual orientation, um, you know, ethnicity, cultural, you know, any kind of cultural considerations that make someone more vulnerable to a variety of different health related consequences. So, um, you know, we certainly can't just look at one aspect of things, but we really need to look at all aspects of a person and the vulnerabilities related to all of those different aspects, so. Great, thank you all. It just really, I appreciate how this really resonates with the way that at least in the US, we really think about disability, right? As coming from a very medical model focus where disability is something that lives with the individual and it's about them and something we need to fix or cure or treat on an individual basis rather than you know, as Angela was mentioning the reference about what are the environments that create disabling conditions and how do we address these issues more system, system, systemically, systematically, all of those things. So I wanted to pause and just see if we had any questions in the room. I know I've got one that was submitted online as well that I can throw in the mix. Anybody, there is one in the room, yes, and I will do my best to repeat your question. Here, you know what? I'm gonna bring you the mic. How about that? That seems easier. Um, hi, thank you all for being on this panel, first of all. Um, I don't know if there really is an answer to this question, um, but something that I've sort of come across when trying to do research on these types of impacts um, is just like straight up lack of data. Um, there aren't enough you know, studies and things that really look at this type of, um, like the types of impacts that things like, not only um, like energy insecurity, food insecurity, whatever, um, but I'm speaking, so I, I'm a nuclear engineer. So I've tried to look at how potentially like, um, like radioactivity or nuclear waste or anything, things that come out of, you know, nuclear power plants, how they disproportionately affect communities. Um, which is a, a large topic um, and there isn't a lot of data at all but with things like that like how um, like when it when we're talking about energy like power plants and stuff like that and you know air pollution those things would obviously um, disproportionately affect people with disabilities but there is not a lot of data about it so how can we I guess like talk about these things and like bring um like awareness to these types of things when there isn't necessarily like the like empirical evidence to support it thank you for that anyone want to jump in with thoughts how do we find is there data out there how do we find it and if not how do we create it yeah 
Well, I'll just say that the data kind of shortage issue um, or the lack of access and transparency around data that's existing is a, a huge issue. Um, but I think that there's also, and I, you know, I appreciate that I'm also a qualitative and a mixed methods study, uh, you know, kind of a researcher, as is Angela. Um, and I think part of it is also about, you know, when we have some of these more emerging questions um, and fields that are not yet well established, sometimes the places to start are really with qualitative research. Um, and that isn't always valued in this high kind of hierarchy of data uh, and of knowledge, but sometimes that's where we have to start. And so as you're thinking about the impacts on specific communities, it might actually require that you go to the community and you kind of understand what's happening on the ground. And then we then know what kinds of additional data sources may be helpful. Um, but I think this is really kind of a critical problem. Um, and there's actually, I mean, in some spaces, there's not a shortage of data. It's just not publicly available. And the way to kind of go about getting it is like circuitous. And, you know, you have to do all this kind of extra work um, if it's kind of made available at all. But I think one kind of work around um, is sometimes also to appreciate uh, the insights that can come from qualitative work. Thank you for that. I'm going to throw out one question that was submitted online and then um, jump back. I know it's hard to believe, but the time is going really quickly. It shouldn't be hard to believe. It's, I feel like you always get into these good conversations and that's how it goes. But a question just to see if anyone has any thoughts um, that was submitted online. Are there any case studies of countries providing security for those with disabilities? And does the recent inflation reduce Inflation Reduction Act in any way mimic it or provide for those with this particular intersectionality? Anyone have any knowledge or thoughts on that? Katie. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so um, I don't know that the Inflation Reduction Act is doing enough for persons with disability. I mean, it, it seems to be going in the correct direction, which is great um, in terms of sustainability and, you know, renewable resources and, um, you know, improvements of financial considerations for electric vehicles and things of that nature um, and prescription drug costs, which is fantastic as well. Always to see that number go down um, for cost. Um, in terms of protection, so I know, um, you know, I'm certainly not an expert on, on international policy, but I know that um, in Europe, I think specifically the UK, there has been cap, caps placed on the cost of energy or, or how much can be charged for energy. So that is something that's a consideration for everyone, including persons with disabilities. Again, we talked about cost. Um, I will say in terms of financial considerations, um, you know, there are several countries who are doing uh, very well in terms of financially supporting um, persons with disabilities. Switzerland is, I think, number one um, in terms of, of um, the amount of money that, you know, they're able to, to provide to persons with disabilities on a monthly basis. Um, I don't know what it translates into dollars or if it is like dollars, but I think it was the number was somewhere around like six or seven thousand. Again, I don't know if that translates directly to like U.S. dollars. Um, but, you know, I don't know that that counts as a protection per se. Well, I mean, I suppose it does in terms of financial considerations for actually being able to afford um, energy for, for treatments and things that are necessary for life. Um, so there's, that's kind of my extent of knowledge of, of protections like kind of internationally um, that are being done. So I don't know if anyone else had any comments on that. No, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I am going to move us. Oh, Angela, did you want to jump in? I was just saying, sorry that I don't have an answer for that question. <laughs> <laughs> no worries at all. I know we're getting short on time and um, our panelists each have so much more information to share. And so I'm a little bit like, ah, what do we do next? So I think what I'm going to do is um, it's, it's approaching 530. I'm going to ask kind of our wrap up question, but would invite each of you to really include any highlights, um, any, I know we didn't get to as many stories as we'd like to, please feel free to, to um, add those in here as we kind of um, move towards the 545 time. The closing question that we had together was just 
thinking more about reforms that might be necessary to tackle some of the root causes of vulnerability. And we've been talking about this kind of throughout the time we've had already, but thinking about vulnerability to energy insecurity and climate impacts um, and ideas for reform. And so at this point, I'm just gonna invite each of you to take a few minutes for sure to think about anything that you didn't get to that is um, top of your list that you wanna make sure to share with our audience tonight. Uh, and also if you can think about those um, kind of the actions that we can be looking at, the, the next steps that we can be looking at. And why don't I just go back to the order that we started with and um, go to Dr. Hernandez first. I just wanna acknowledge that this has been really a fruitful conversation and um, so rarely do we, at least I, you know, this is kind of a first in terms of really centering uh, disability and thinking about um, this specific topic. And so I appreciate the organizers for thinking um, creatively about this and also um, so critically. I, I wanna say that one big piece, and this has come up, I think, repeatedly, um, but I think we have to figure out ways of um, approaching affordability and access um, very seriously. Um, these are policy decisions and the fact that we have really ambitious policies that have really not carved out those very specific things and including for specific populations uh, to me means that there's still work to be done. I, I want to be thinking about populations and places. Um, I, you know, we, we have to be thinking about which populations are disproportionately impacted um, and even the ways in which we may not be able to recognize it right now, but certainly disability um, and health con chronic health conditions, medical vulnerabilities, et cetera, uh, are important and not just the physical ones, but also mental health and emotional kind of well-being. Uh, a, a lot of times the other story that I wanted to share was uh, about um, someone living with um, mental health issues um, in Puerto Rico um, during uh, Hurricane Maria and what the aftermath of that represented for him and for his family and what kind of protracted recovery looks like for people living with mental health uh, conditions. So I want us to also be thinking more robustly about what the definitions of health and disability are, um, but also thinking about the disproportionate impact in, in certain places and how some communities kind of bear the disproportionate burden of uh, unaffordable utility bills, of disconnections, and also of delayed restoration of power after power outages. So we wanna be thinking a lot about how do we prioritize certain groups and not re, um, re uh, basically reinstate uh, these kind of, um, uh, the, the kind of powers that be and the privileges that exist um, and how some of these decisions are being made. I think particularly when it comes to uh, the restoration of services uh, kind of post power outages, we don't think about that. And yet, you know, it's some of the same areas that, um, you know, kind of experience all kinds of privileges that end up being turned on first uh, or have backup power, et cetera. And so they never really have the same hardships. And so uh, thinking about people, um, populations and places, and also thinking about ways of kind of offering broader protections and being more robust in our definitions and acknowledgement um, of health and disability um, status. Thank you. And if I could go to Dr. Frederick next. Oops, and I think you're, uh, you're muted now. Oops, sorry, I thought I was muted and stuff. Okay. Perfect. So, I would like to, I have so many things to say, and I think the the concept that might tie it all together um, the best is, so in public affairs, the field of public affairs, there's a concept called administrative burden. And this concept kind of captures the ways in which um, citizens of a state uh, experience costs as they seek services um, with a, a, a government. And um, in each stage of disasters, I have found ways that dis 
people with varying disabilities experience administrative burdens. And, you know, if you ask me what I could do to change, I would like to change the Texas power grid, but I don't have the power to do that. Um, but I think we can think about the types of burdens, the types of obstacles that are placed in disabled people's way um, that, that keep them from getting the benefits they deserve in recovery, that keep them from um, getting services in the emergency, the response stage of disasters, and also for preparation. So I uh, hope you don't mind. I just want to share a few stories that capture some of these uh, administrative burdens in different stages of the disaster. So in the preparation stage, um, you know, individual preparedness is really touted now as the way like the, the responsibility is on individuals to prepare for long duration power outages and for disabled people and um, people are told, you know, you've got to register with the special needs registries that Texas and other states have. And then you've got to register with your local power company as a power dependent customer and people um, in Texas. Uh, believed that doing these things was protecting them. Like they thought that they were preparing for disasters by registering first year, the Texas uh, state of Texas emergency assistance registry, by registering as a critical power customer with their utility company through the Public Utilities Commission of Texas. And um, those services were nowhere, nowhere to be found in the disaster. And it led to a great deal of hurt and betrayal in disability communities. One parent I interviewed um, who really, really profoundly struggled to keep her child alive during this disaster said, you know, why do we have these registries and why are they so difficult to get on when, um, you know, what, what I found out really quickly is there's no Calvary, the Calvary isn't coming. They meant nothing in our greatest time of need. So those are forms of administrative burdens that ask the bureaucratic asks that we make of disabled people uh, and that kind of lead people to believe that they're going to receive a service um, when those services actually aren't aren't available. Um, and then um, there are other ways uh, during the response stage. I, I mentioned the stories and there are several of them of people I interviewed who called 911 for assistance and um, um, they were told we the only place we can take you is a warming shelter and that just didn't work for people for multiple reasons. And so they chose to stay in their freezing dangerous homes. Um, and then in the recovery stage, um, there's a recent study that's out um, that shows that disabled people are less likely to receive assistance from FEMA. And there are all kinds of barriers people with disabilities um, experience trying to access services. So um, one blind woman in San Antonio pointed out, you know, after when the disaster, we were moving out of the disaster and San Antonio opened up these water stations. Well, I don't drive and my, my normal modes of transportation aren't gonna work for carrying gallons of water home, right? You can't take that home on the city bus and an Uber driver is not gonna sit in a line for hours with you uh, to get that water. And so to think about um, standing, being required to stand in line, that does, that's not, that can worsen certain people's disabilities or they're unable to do so altogether. So, um, and one more story I will share. Um, one woman I interviewed, and this this was one of the interviews that I, you know, hung up the phone and I was like, this is not a boring journal article. This this has to be a book. Like I, I want people to read these stories. So um she's a white woman who lives in a low-income apartment um, with her family and her uh uh, because of a flood in the apartment, uh, her apartment soon after the disaster was covered in black mold, and she was not allowed to move because of restrictions during the pandemic for um, uh, federal housing assistance. They, they were um, disallowing people to change locations. And so she had to repair the apartment herself and paint it herself. And that was um, so disabling uh, for her with her physical disabilities that it caused her to be bedridden for weeks afterward. And so I think if I, if I could share one concept, it would be administrative burden, because I think the thread of administrative burden uh, runs through so many stages of disasters. So thank you. I'm sorry I went on a little long there. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll kick it over to Dr. Collins next. Um, I would say so um, in relation to kind of the question, um, I think first and foremost is building awareness. Um, 
you know, and, and there is not the level of awareness that there should be um, in terms of, of need and in terms of what's actually occurring climate wise with disabilities, et cetera. So I think, I think first and foremost, actually having a global awareness of what's going on. Um, additionally, I think whenever there is any policy changes, creation or change itself, um, the, the folks who are most impacted are the ones that ha should have the loud, loudest voice at the table, the ones who should be, you know, calling a lot of the shots. And so, uh, you know, same is true of, of talking about disability and disability justice and policy changes, right? So um, we don't always see that, unfortunately, where, you know, it's not necessarily the voices of those most impacted who are making the decisions. It's frequently not. Um, so I think that that's a huge part of consideration for change in policy in the future. Um, I did want to briefly mention, um, additionally, if we're talking about um, disability and climate, um, I want to mention the the concept of eco-ableism. I don't, I'm not sure if, if you've heard of that before. Um, essentially, we all kind of understand, or a lot of us understand what able, ableism is, but um, in policy change related to the climate, we're seeing some of this, what is called eco-ableism, and essentially, um, in a nutshell, what that is, is that is um, things like, for instance, um, you know, with, with this, I think plastic straws became kind of the, the demon of, of climate change. And it was get, get rid of single use plastic and get rid of plastic straws. Um, but in, we're not considering folks who actually may really need plastic straws. And we know paper straws last all of about two seconds before they disintegrate. Um, and folks may not be able to use, they may need straws that bend, they may not be able to use heavy metal straws, right? So I think, you know, other considerations, well, we should all use the stairs instead of using elevators, you know, because it conserves energy. Well, maybe, you know, there are folks who, who that is not an option for them mobility wise, right? Um, public transportation, again, may not always be an option if it's not truly accessible to everyone. Um, and then saving energy, you know, by cooling or heating or cooling the home or turning down the AC or the heat, again, may not be an option for, for a lot of folks with disabilities. So we want to make sure that when we're um, advocating for change in policy, um, that we're, we're getting moving away from this, this idea of, of eco-ableism as well. So um, that's pretty much what I'll say about that. Um, yeah, I think um, within the UW community itself, I've seen a lot of communities um, take action to help um, victims of these climate disasters, like the Pakistani Student Association at UW alone raised about $7,000 to give to flood relief there. And there's a lot of, like Dr. Collins said, um, making awareness for reputable places to help or how to get involved. And I think one thing that can be helpful for people who might not identify as someone with a disability or maybe they're adjacent to the idea um, is understanding that it's not, um, it like, looking at it through a cultural lens as well. I think um, in tandem, a lot of the places being affected by climate change are like South Asia, the Caribbean, South America. They've been victim to not only colonization, but also like disproportionately affected by climate change. And these countries hold a lot of culture, um, a lot of language, a lot of teachings that are important to people, not only there and um, diaspora populations as well, like myself. And the ability to interact with this identity um, as being a disabled person, I think comes from the strength and community you find through your ethnic and religious or other cultural identities, right? So I think it's understanding that if, if one thing gets affected neg negatively, it's going to affect everything equally. So in that sense, I, can, I think we can find some common threads as to how we can all be involved in this issue and understand how we can all make a difference as well. Thank you so much. I know we're really close to time. Um, I did also want to, Amal, are you able to talk a little bit about the Disability Cultural Center and the efforts to get that up and running? Um, I think that would be really great information for everybody to hear just a little bit about that before we close out tonight. Yeah, so this past um, fall, a uh, coalition started of medical students, law students, and members of the community came together to create this initiative to create a cultural center on campus for persons with disabilities. And um, I believe our, our grand opening is around next week or so. Um, and we're located on campus right across from Gordon's Dining Hall. We have a physical space and we plan to have a lot of cultural programming this semester that helps students find a space within campus and um, in, uh, discuss intersectionality between all these identities. 
Um, so if you're interested, you can let me or Mari know and um, stay tuned for a lot of fun events and um, a lot of great discussions. Thank you. Allison is asking if there's a website or a place that we can learn more. Um, to it's coming. <laughs> I will leave you. This is Mari again. Um, definitely, we are working on getting an, a website up and running. I can just say, as a again, as a person with a disability myself, coming from another institution that had a disabled student cultural center, I was so excited um, to get one going here. And it would not have happened at all without the efforts of the students who really came together and pushed a proposal forward. So we're thrilled to be supporting them this year. Um, and we've got some space in the same building as the McBurney Center that's just been refurnished. And as Amal mentioned, we're hoping to do kind of some soft openings next week. So watch for information about that. Um, I wanna just thank our panelists so much for this conversation tonight. Again, I feel like we, we had many more questions. I know there were questions in the chat that we didn't get to as well. And I'm so sorry for that. Um, I feel like we just barely scratched the surface. And I really hope that um, the surface that was scratched is is interesting enough to you all to do a little bit more reading and research on your own so that we can continue the, the conversation, the discussion that need, we need to have in this um, topic area. So thank you so much to our panelists and I will turn it back over to Scott to close us out. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you so much. This has been a rich discussion. We see the, the comments coming online uh, thanking so. Really appreciate you all uh, coming and, and being part of this conversation. I uh, want a reminder, next, our next forum will be February 28th, uh, Black Leaders in Clean Energy. Um, it'll be, again, uh, Tuesday at 4.30. So I uh, hope to see many of you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.